our dice. Welcome to the Stateless Code video. This is video number 43 in our series nerddice.com where we create a Ruby on Rails application to manage tabletop role playing. And in this video we're going to start by looking at kind of user needs and features and I'm going to start with myself. So um, I would recommend whenever you're doing, especially in your first solo project in a um, programming language or uh, framework or anything like that, that you should code something that you know and have interest in. So in this case, I'm going to, this isn't my first solo project, obviously, but I'm doing something that I have subject matter expertise in so that I don't have to rely upon another person to be providing me with requirements and telling me whether those requirements have been met and all those other things that can um, kind of impede you if, if you're working on a solo project. Obviously those teamwork and interaction things are valuable and important, but in the process of learning how to code, learning how to program and engineer and turn um, kind of ideas for features into realized features, uh, starting with something that you know and can serve as a subject matter expert for yourself on will help you stay unblocked and get more volume of, um, of practice done than um, kind of starting out by being reliant on somebody else. It is important, and, and I think another crucial thing in terms of just overall success as a software engineer or programmer is being able to kind of speak with the business about the business requirements of something and the technical um, execution and requirements of, of those things that uh, I think if you want to pursue software engineering as a career, your um, potential, I think it's going to be largely influenced by how well you speak both business and technology. Um, you can kind of be a rank and file developer who just kind of, I know the technology and I, somebody gives me a requirement and I can execute on it. But if you are thinking about kind of senior or tech lead or oh, I just hit my microphone, anything like that, then you're going to want to be able to interact with stakeholders, um, kind of understand the business problems that you're trying to solve and whether the technological solutions for that are appropriate to that business use case. So all that is a way of long introduction to the fact that I'm going to talk, talk some about how I play uh, tabletop role playing. I currently am mostly playing in person with my kids as a, as a DM. I uh, do uh, several campaigns, probably too many, going on that kind of no one of them gets enough individual attention. Uh, and then two out of my three children currently uh, have their own campaigns as of May 2023 when this is being recorded. Uh, we play in person. You can see a little bit of the table behind me um, kind of actually on a tabletop and with kind of pencil and paper character sheets grab some here so there's some um oh that is a there's gary the duck some notes here i think i've got things turned around the wrong way so actual character sheets here um and then uh in terms of um uh, books and rules and stuff like that uh, i've got quite an assembly of analog physical books uh, that we use for our gaming. So um, kind of in person is what we, uh, what we do uh, in terms of uh, improving over the true analog pencil and paper. I use, um, this is very nerdy. I use um, Git repo to track my stuff so that right now I'm on my desktop computer. I do most of my gaming on my Mac laptop rather than the Ubuntu computer, but I've got a server in the house that serves as a Git repo and we can send 
uh, preparation. So my son may be working on something on his uh, campaign branch down in another part of the house. He We can push that to the repo and then uh, clone it down on my laptop before we have a gaming session. And uh, you can check out his branch and, and do that. And then uh, most of what we do is like in sublime text. So I'll, I'll be showing some of that later. Um, so that's kind of how we kind of have essentially a, we're modified pencil and paper, actual tabletop players. And then I play in a campaign uh, that's pretty much exclusively online. So um, we'll, I'll talk some about that maybe in this video or another video. And for that, I use D&D um, &D Beyond for uh, kind of the character sheet and management. Uh, the DM for that uses uh, Schmeppy a lot for maps. Uh, we, um, we use Discord as a kind of voice over IP method of interacting and then doing some kind of chat features and stuff like that on there. So uh, that's kind of what we do. Let's see here before I go over to the screen share mode. Uh, we do use Hero Forge. Um, and I've got a 3D printer behind uh, Sammy, the uh, the Tiefling Bard there, who we'll uh, get a, more acquainted with in the retrospective. Uh, but you can see here, like, uh, one of the things that I'll do is, if you're going through, like, an in-person thing and you've got fog of war or something like that, you can, uh, a roll of wrapping paper with grid on it um, works really well for kind of that intermediate like sketching something out and then um adding more details as you go along the um the one inch square works really well for um uh, printed miniatures and stuff like that and then like that was something that i would have i have in a book with graph paper somewhere yeah so i would have had like the graph paper kind of smaller version of that sketched out and then in my um sublime text um, repo I would have had kind of a legend for that. Uh, well, I'll go through some stuff about encounters and how I run those, um, backstory things, searching for spell descriptions and um, uh, monsters and stat blocks and stuff like that. Um, and then um, I think that's it for now. I'll get into the screen share mode and see you in a few minutes and we'll talk through some of the things that I do. All right, we're back. So this is my, I've got sublime text uh, shared right now. Um, I, I do most of the, uh, the I do the, the video code editing here using VS Code primarily because it's uh, free and freely avail available. Uh, sublime text has, um, I, I think, I don't know what the current uh, license fee is, but uh, it's a, a paid application. I think it's got a very generous um, trial period, as in potentially forever, but um, if you do use it, I pay for it. Uh, anyway, the uh, some of the things that work well with kind of this, this is essentially, for the most part, a, uh, tree, di a, a tree of directories and text files. So, um, if I, let's say in this utilities, I've got some magic items, some, um, I should probably have my monsters and enemies there in terms of organizational structure as well. Uh, but let's say I want to do this. Um, Sublime has a, a really good search feature essentially called go to anything where you can, I can hit control P here on the, the screen. And let's say I want to start typing uh, delayed, blast fireball it will come up and I can get the um, the spell description uh, there very handily I've got that done for spells I don't obviously have it uh, this is kind of a highly tedious and manual way of getting descriptions and stuff like that um, to, um, to to a source so um, like then let's say I've got a magic item I've got the kind of the description for that or um, seal, shield of missile attraction uh, with the, the information, essentially the um, spell description for that. 
Uh, and then in any given campaign, let's use an example of some um, monster stat blocks here, um, kind of gives you the, the stats, the typical hit points, essentially what you'd have in a normal um, stat block. So um, all these things obviously could be better handled and uh, work nicely as attributes for, say, a um, model view controller style of uh, application uh, and would translate well to that. The, um, and then kind of when you get specific, one of the, each of the campaigns kind of have their own folder here. So we'll say the Sapphire campaign in one of the uh, groups here, I've got kind of the maps and then we've got a, um, say a main map legend here. We'll go through and kind of have the, some of the encounters and stuff like that, that I've got planned or like that, that those numbers will s correspond to numbers I've got on my graph paper map or something like that. So that I've got kind of the preparation um, aligned with that. The, um, let's see here in, you've got kind of information about different NPCs and stuff like that, um, plot hook, uh, and then session notes. This is kind of where I go and um, let's say that I've got a a group of um, combatants that I, I want to set up a combat encounter. The way that I'll typically do that is I'll have as a um, DM, I'll roll for the, the NPCs and stuff like that and then have everybody in there um, kind of pop them in wherever they are, depending on where they're, uh, where they are in the encounter um, initiative stack and get to the bottom and go back to the top. And then as damage is inflicted, I will um, kind of keep that information up to date. Um, if there are any things like um, notes that I, I need to keep in mind. So let's say that um, this uh, Albert is a uh, halfling, so he can hide behind medium creatures. Um, that's things like that that I wanna try to remind myself of or whether somebody's concentrating on a spell, that sort of thing, but it's all uh, kind of manual. So this is uh, better than pen and paper. I can, or pencil and paper, I can uh, like copy and paste things from one place to another, um, but it's still very kind of unstructured and um, manual. I can search, let's say I wanna um, I'll go into an Eberron, campaign here so um and then in terms of my players i've got uh a spread of kind of um some some kids like the um kind of the mechanics of combat and encounters and stuff like that other um other kids aren't into that at all and i kind of need to try to streamline uh com combat encounters and make them as efficient as, as possible while kind of um, making sure that the plot and story works. That's kind of the um, the main thing that we've got going on there is the, the um, desire for kind of good story, well thought out uh, NPCs and um, interactions, plot hooks, plot callbacks. So that's one thing that um, I think an app would be could do really well is let's say that you've got somebody from an encounter um, and the, either the person doesn't get killed or the person gets killed and you can like, or the, the creature uh, gets killed and you could have, or, or one of your character players does something that should have a consequence to it. You can kind of uh, manually kind of write a callback note and try to bring that back uh, in your storytelling, but having something that kind of in a more structured uh, and friendly way kind of allows you to kind of note your callbacks and then occasionally uh, prompt you 
um, or allow you to list kind of your outstanding callbacks that you haven't um, resolved yet. Uh, things like that, I think, would be um, useful from a storytelling standpoint for me. Uh, other things, like, because I'm largely kind of pencil and paper, things like generating loot. So after a, a combat encounter, it's basically in uh, current state, it's, oh, go take a snack break while I go and uh, generate or uh, allocate the, the loot. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll do that just in terms of uh, preparation, but you don't always, uh, not every encounter that you come up with is prepared. And so things like being able to um, produce an encounter on the fly if your uh, players go off of the beaten path. Uh, encounter balancing, I think, would be valuable to me. So the ability to uh, kind of slightly uh, buff or nerf uh, an encounter, um, if you're you're doing that by hand, it, it can be very tedious with no real uh, feedback on whether you're doing it, whether you're actually achieving your, your purpose. Um, you could do something in an app along the lines of, or a web application along the lines of like, I'm going to um, run this encounter a few times and kind of see um, what level of damage is done to the party or things like that. And then you can, the idea, maybe you um, nudge in one direction or another to see kind of, um, to m make your uh, NPCs either add, add or take away some or make the individual ones um, stronger or weaker. Um, Things like taking a monster stat block and instead of having it be um, six goblins who all have the same amount of hit points and uh, use the same weapons and all that stuff, like th throw in a little bit of variation. So instead of using the um, a, a variation that would be tedious to do in person if you're um, running one of these. So um, roll the hit points instead of having them all have the same amount of generic hit points from the, the monster manual or uh, have them vary the weapons that they're using against you so that it's not all um, short swords or scimitars or whatever. Um, so that you, you, for one, it gives you a little bit more flavor in terms of storytelling and it provides a little bit more uh, mechanical um, uh, very kind of variety uh, to your players as they're playing. Uh, it can also kind of help you distinguish between them. Like, so I'm going to attack the one wielding the scimitar versus I'm going to attack the one that's got a sling, stuff like that, um, I think could be beneficial. Um, if I'm looking at one of my, let's say, the evil campaign, I've got an Eberron right now, if I go in, I've got like a bio for one of my characters, and then I've got a related NPC's um, kind of text file here. So I could, um, if I go and search my whole set of stuff here, I could look for this and see if this NPC is mentioned in any other uh, things. In this case, it's just the... Um, the character's bio and the the list of related NPCs. But if you had one that uh, two two or more characters were related to, or NPCs related to other NPCs, having those connections, I think, uh, would be uh, beneficial if they had like let's say, right now searching for those things and going up the the tree or doing the uh, Control Shift F and trying to find. Um, everywhere that say void is mentioned um, you can see that um, there are um, it shows up in um, some of these things as like the word avoid shows up and stuff like that so it can be hard to to find things like that and this is completely just straight up text sh search un uh, undifferentiated. So the idea, like, I want to search um, for void, but only 
with relate with respect to related NPCs, or if I'm displaying void, um, you could have thinking in terms of web layout, you could have like a sidebar or a tab set or something like that that has like related NPCs and you could um, kind of insert a new one as you needed, or you can uh, click into that uh, NPC, ideally see that NPC's uh, stat block um, and then see the other uh, relations that that NPC has. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Let me go through my my interview. Let's see here. How you play. Um, so typically use 5e, um, almost always in person, uh, except for that one where I'm a, a player in an online campaign. Um, digital tools vary whether I play in person. Yeah, very much. So I'll, I'll use D&D Beyond in uh, the online one because in that case, my DM has uh, the content and has it shared with me. I haven't uh, seen the value of going in and spending another thousand bucks or whatever for a bunch of content that I've already got. Um, and, and so the, another thing with regard to digital tools is what's the purpose that they've, they've got there. So um, a um, commercial website may like their, their purpose is maybe I'm going to sell you more digital content. And so everything is going to be geared around trying to make you want more digital content. And uh, in some cases, frustrating your user experience to uh, get you to upgrade or buy more stuff, stuff like that, uh, which, I mean, you're, you've got a product, you're trying to sell it. Um, that's one way to create demand. But um, obviously, in this case, I have no such constraints for this project. So what I want to do is try to make life as good as possible for somebody like me who um, may not, um, may have already invested heavily in uh, analog uh, materials and um, wants to kind of have access to the materials that they already, uh, they already bought uh, without kind of having everything be about um, the next upsell or, or feature upgrade or anything like that. Um, again, this is primarily about, this project is primarily about teaching computer programming. So um, in that sense, uh, if this site never gets a user other than me and maybe my family, then so what? Um, but um, at least since I'm the primary user, I want to have as good of an experience as I possibly can. Uh, so I've kind of got that kind of selfish uh, motivation for doing that. Whereas if somebody's got a goal that they want to upsell you stuff, uh, that's going to impact the experience that you have with them. Um, let's see here. How often do you search up rules, spell descriptions, ma magic items, etc.? cetera? Um, fairly often, which is why I've got the, uh, the sublime text thing for all the spell descriptions, which comes in very handy. I have not done a lot of, um, I mean, that with other things like um, monster stat blocks or uh, magic items or something like that, that, that there's a potential for that or to kind of extract something out and load it into a, um, a site or something like that. Uh, thinking in terms of um, it can, it can be creating a, let me see if I've got it handy. Creating something with the player's handbook here can be a bit tedious. So you're flipping back and forth. You've got your, um, your race information in chapter two. Uh, it's not even alphabetical. So you've got kind of the more common races and, uh, as 5e defines them in the front and then you've got the less common ones and kind of um, they're, they're not really in uh, any sort of alphabetical order and then you're flipping as you're creating a character you're flipping to uh, 
chapter two for the race stuff and then in chapter four for background and background features then back in for classes to chapter three um and then the um the equipment that you're um choosing is in up in chapter five or whatever and so you're flipping around a lot as you create a a character um and and uh, an analog character creation um, is even if you've got high knowledge and know the book really well, um, it's a kind of labor intensive process and one that's prone to error. That, that there can be things that you forget and leave out. There can be um, other things like that that happen when you're, um, when you're playing. It's often uh, easy to forget certain things like keeping track of, um, concentration or statuses or other things like that um, can be a bit um, challenging when you're playing uh, kind of in-person tabletop. It's kind of relying on the, um, the vigilance and kind of execution of the DM and the players in order to kind of keep track of all that stuff. Um, let's see here. Uh, do I play in any campaigns that other people are running? So yeah, I've got three, two for my kids and the one that I play online. Um, digital experience is very, um, we've kind of already talked about that. Um, what sizes are the parties that I typically GM for? So it's probably, um, I've got three kids who all play and then we have some campaigns where um, kind of their uncle or a few other friends will join in and stuff like that. So um, it's usually kind of in the three to six range, probably closer to the three. Um, I occasionally, um, with my kids, will have a uh, DM player character um, that <clears throat> plays along with them and, um, and stuff like that um, for larger parties than just my, my three kids. I, I won't do that. So kind of uh, things like that. Do you ever fudge rolls? And if digital, how do you handle it? Not, not all that often. Um, let's see here. How do you schedule gaming sessions? So um, scheduling is something that I don't do well. Um, it's kind of held up um, kind of some of these other user uh, interviews and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, something that helped with scheduling um, it's probably not a priority in terms of features for this app, but um, something that gets around my weaknesses in that regard wouldn't hurt. Uh, let's see here. What are the features that are missing from a tool set that I wish I had? So uh, something like uh, I've kind of mentioned already, um, the ability to have kind of an easy uh, initiative screen where you can kind of see what's going on, kind of who the current um, person up is, whether people have used the reactions, um, kind of with other relevant things that help you keep track of the, uh, the initiative stack. Uh, thinking in terms of Rails features, something like that could work well with Action Cable where you could have both your players and your um, uh, DM looking at the same initiative stack, obviously with more stuff visible to the, uh, to the DM than to the players, but, um, things that help, um, your players kind of keep track of, um, what they're looking at, maybe along the lines of a, uh, ex collapsible, uh, thing where you can see kind of more information about any one of the, uh, char characters like accordion style, potentially. Um, things like that, uh, things like the, um, kind of storytelling plot callback, um, uh, character to character relationship things, um, all those, um, features I think would be, uh, beneficial, um, do you subscription costs for existing tools provide barriers to enjoyment with your gaming group. So yeah, obviously if, um, already talked about that. Um, yeah. So 
I think that provides enough information about me as a player. We'll learn more as we go through the process of uh, making the app. Um, I'll maybe I'll decide whether I do any kind of simulated user experience stuff kind of with me as a user uh, for some of these um, other uh, tabletop sites to kind of uh, talk through some of that. But I think we've kind of got the, the basics on me. I'm uh, generally an analog player and um, would be, if I'm making this site for me, trying to make it kind of uh, so that somebody who has that background just make it more convenient to do what I'm already doing. Uh, ideally allow for uh, players to also kind of log in and have accounts and have tailored experiences based on kind of whether they're uh, players or not. Uh, things like storing character sheet slash information um, would be beneficial. Um, even if even if you've got a physical copy of your sheet, kind of having that um, digital backup, I think, is, um, is valuable. And um, things like that, um, encounter generation and balancing, uh, maybe even creating or generating a, a town or a dungeon, uh, would be, uh, kind of, kind of cool. So, um, if you've got, um, you kind of go off of the path there of what you've got planned. Okay. We've got a, uh, a little villa kind of off, um, in this direction and um, kick off the job to generate it. And then by the time you get there, you've got um, some stuff, some material to, to work and things like that, that uh, allow you to get kind of a larger play to preparation ratio. So um, the th something that reduces the overhead for doing um, plot and encounter planning, um, treasure and loot awarding experience point calculation. If you go the experience point route, as opposed to the, uh, the milestone route in terms of how you, uh, award experience, uh, things like kind of just remember all, all the stuff you need to do to create a character, um, and kind of help yourself level up, um, things like that reminding you of whether like you let's say you've got abilities per short rest or long rest or day or something like that helping keep track of whether those have been used up um there's a lot of potential here and uh we'll get to it want to create your own ruby gem but don't know where to start code along with me on the end-to-end -end journey of the nerd dice project we'll configure and publish the gem Use GitHub Actions to trigger builds and tests, and create magic methods with Ruby metaprogramming that can roll any number of dice, all while using a test-driven approach. Go to statelesscode.com slash nerddicegem to level up. Thanks for watching this Stateless Code video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and spread the word. Check out our growing library of videos on our social media channels, follow us at Stateless Code, and taxation is theft.